Hi, I'm Bill Rapisi, Executive Director of Lymphatic Education and Research Network, and I just want to take this opportunity to thank all of you for joining us today for our symposium series. I also want to take this opportunity to thank all of you who have become members of LEARN and help support this series so that we can continue bringing this kind of groundbreaking information uh, to you in your homes and offices. Uh, I would also suggest for all of you who have not become members of LEARN, $5 a month, you can become a member of LEARN and help support this programming and the research that we do. Thanks very much for joining us and I look forward to having you become a member. Good morning, my name is Michaela Scobie. I um, run a research laboratory at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York. And it is a great um, joy for me and privilege to give this online symposium uh, on the topics of lymphatics and cancer that has been generously uh, sponsored and organized by uh, LEARN. So today what I would like to speak about is about the role of lymphatic system in cancer and I have been working in this field now for two decades. Um, as a disclaimer, I'm a PhD, not a, a medical doctor, so I don't work directly uh, with the patients. But over the years, we have gained quite an insight um, into the mechanisms of important roles that lymphatics play in cancer metastasis. So shown here, uh, very much like the lymphatic system, is actually a, a delta of the Columbia River in West Washington, Oregon, that just in a similar way, in analogy, um, drains and uh, starts with the small streams, like in lymphatics with the small vessels, bringing it to the larger streams and ultimately into the largest um, uh, vessel, which brings lymph back into the blood vasculature. So similar way as these deltas collect the fluids um, and the material and life from the surrounding lymphatic system is deeply embedded into the tissue architecture and communicates with the cells closely uh, to ensure tissue homeostasis. So in the human body, uh, there is many lymphatic vessels and numerous lymph nodes. In fact, if the total human lymphatic vasculature length would be measured, it would be about 3,500 kilometers in length. And in this space, cells, immune cells primarily, and then cancer or tumor cells have to navigate to reach their destinations. There are about 450 lymph nodes in a young adult human body. They vary in the size. They um, can also change uh, upon when there is presence of cancer and inflammation in the various tissue, in the various um, organs and the positions they can also uh, vary in their architecture. So lymphatic system is uh, very important for metastatic dissemination, which can occur by three prim primary pathways. Uh, tumors can use lymphatic pathway for spread. They can take uh, blood as a route to disseminate. And there's also another uh, special way of dissemination called direct seeding. Ovarian cancer, for example, has preference for direct seeding, which really means that the tumor cells see directly onto the different organs in the abdominal cavity. So just briefly to recap the main steps of metastasis, it uh, typically starts with the formation of a primary tumor in its original location, so in C2 cancer, which then over time acquires the ability to invade into the uh, surrounding tissue and ultimately invade into the vasculature. Here, tumor cells can actually make a decision whether to enter into the lymphatic or blood vasculature. And um, it is a subject of intense research today to understand how the decision is made and what the consequences are. So tumor cells can enter directly into the blood and then we carry the way to the distant organs. For example, lung is a common site of metastasis. They need to survive in the blood, uh, which is a challenge most of the Cells that enter into the blood will actually die, so the overall efficiency of metastasis once they're in the blood is actually very low. Tumor cells then have to arrest at the secondary site to the blood vasculature there, for example, pulmonary vasculature as shown here, and then seed uh, the actual organ. These individual cells that have seeded the organ can stay here 
and remain as solitary for many years, for example, in case of breast cancer, these cells can sit there for decades without really forming overt metastasis and uh, causing clinical symptoms of the disease. And at some point, uh, which in some cancers happen sooner and some later, um, these solitary cells acquire the ability to form first micrometastasis and then uh, start growing into larger lesions, which then results in colonization of the entire organ um, by metastatic growth and ultimately um, bad outcome for the patient. Now, lymphatic uh, uh, lymph node involvement um, is an important component of the process. And in this initial step, tumor cells have the option of entering the lymphatics, entering into the lymph nodes, and then being delivered via lymph into the systemic circulation to complete um, the entire circle. And I will talk about that specifically in more detail. Now, different cancers have different preference for different organs. Just to illustrate here um, a few points, breast, for example, can metastasize to lung, liver, bone, and brain, so it has pretty wide organ tropism, where there's other cancers like prostate, for example, will preferentially um, metastasize into the bone, colorectal preferentially metastasize to the liver and the lung. So not all cancers um, will take, uh, take uh, metastasis and uh, uh, cause a disease in, uh, in all different organs. However, it is important to know that all of these tumors will actually uh, grow in the lymph nodes. So majority of the tumors will disseminate and grow in the lymph nodes with very few notable exceptions like brain tumors and uh, sarcomas. So most epithelial tumors um, will all, all have a common feature that they do prefer um, arriving and growing in the lymph nodes. So why are lymphatics important in cancer? But first of all, traditionally, lymph node metastasis is an important prognostic indicator. And even today, um, with a, a, a huge advancement in the precision medicine, lymph node metastasis remains one of the key prognostic uh, indicators for the patient. Go, to go back a little bit in the history, this was first observed in the 18th century by um, surgeon Henri Ledran, which actually note, noticed for the first time that breast cancer is a local disease before it spreads into the lymph nodes. So at the time, cancer was uh, considered a disease of body humors, so basically considered a systemic disease uh, from its outset. And he noticed that before tumor cells actually can spread into the um, lymph nodes, there is a hope that there may be a cure by removing that lesion. And for that reason, um, uh, this finding, this, this period um, in, in, cancer, in a, the history of this disease is called the optimistic period. Um, and indeed, as we know very well today, um, it is uh, in the clinic very well established how important um, is the finding whether sentinel lymph node is positive with cancer. So sentinel lymph node biopsy is a standard of care for most cancer types. And this is really based on the premise that if the sentinel lymph node is free of metastasis, other lymph nodes would also be negative. Uh, sentinel lymph node is the first lymph node draining the site of the tumor. Uh, and it's not the only important uh, piece of information. It is also the extent of lymph node metastasis, which is widely used as a criterion for staging. So if lymph nodes are positive or not, and how many lymph nodes are positive determines treatment choices um, for the patient, obviously, along the other parameters, um, such as tumor size and uh, uh, histological characteristic, uh, along with its molecular characteristics to date. So sentinel lymph node biopsy has really revolutionized the way patients uh, approached because at the time lymphadenectomy, so the removal of complete lymph nodes in the area, has been a standard of care and that has resulted in significant morbidity uh, for the patients. So once it has been established that indeed once that sentinel lymph node, which is the first lymph node that drains the fluids, um, the interstitial fluids from the tumor site, is identified, and this is done by injection of uh, different tracers. They can be 
labeled uh, with the fluorescence. They can be dyed, they can be radioactive tra tracers, and this is done intraoperatively in the clinic before the uh, surgery. So once that node is identified um, and taken out, uh, it is pretty much with great certainty that if that one is free of metastasis, uh, it is very unlikely that there is no metastasis in other lymph nodes and at the distant sites. So in addition to the sentinel lymph node status, lymphatic vessel invasion is also an important for prognostic indicator. And what is seen here is a small um, lesion, small breast cancer surrounded by several lymphatic vessels which are empty. They don't contain tumor cells. However, what pathologist looks for is a lymphatic vessel shown here with the presence of tumor emboli. And this alone already uh, when sentinel lymph node is negative is an important prognostic uh, indicator so for negative prognosis. Some cancers um, uh, have particular pre preference for lymphatics. For example, um, head and neck cancer is a very lymphatic uh, spreading cancer. And another example is inflammatory breast cancer. Inflammatory breast cancer is a very unique type of um, breast cancer, which uh, typically doesn't present with an obvious tumor mass. So frequently there is no nodule at all, and for that reason it is very difficult to detect. And the tumor is mainly present in dilated dermal lymphatics. So presence of tumor emboli in dilated dermal lymphatics is a histological hallmark of inflammatory breast cancer, along with a couple of other clinical symptoms such as erythema, so redness of the breast, edema, and peau d'orange, typical um, presentation, uh, orange peel presentation of the overlying skin. So in this cancer type, the tumor growth is diffuse, there is no apparent mass except in dermal lymphatics, and interestingly, it is often, it is often misdiagnosed for these reasons. Once diagnosed, patients have very uh, poor prognosis, and it is typically diagnosed at late stage 3B or stage 4. What is important to note here is that this is an extreme example um, of a cancer that has a particular affinity for lymphatic system and is also particularly aggressive. So when one thinks about that relationship between cancer and lymphatics, it is without exception that whenever lymphatics are involved with cancer and the more lymphatics are involved with cancer, the worse the outcome. So, um, and that has been a motivated, motivating question actually for our research to understand um, this important clinical finding um, more on a molecular and cellular level and really get insight into this mechanism as to how do lymphatics as a component of the tumor microenvironment, support and perhaps promote tumor metastasis. So one important question to answer is how and where do tumor cells enter into the lymphatic vasculature? Tumor cells typically enter into the lymphatic capillaries, which are illustrated here in green. Um, in red are blood capillaries, and what one can appreciate immediately is that the lymphatic capillaries are much wider, they are larger in size. They also begin with blind ends uh, in the tissues, and uh, the flow velocities in those vessels are much slower than those in the blood, which perhaps creates uh, a favorable environment for tumor cells uh, once they enter. So uh, tumor cells can enter into the pre-existing lymphatic capillaries, or they can enter into the newly formed lymphatic vessels, which can be generated inside the tumor or around the tumor. Uh, this process is called tumor lymphangiogenesis, which really uh, describes a process of generation of new lymphatic vessels from the pre-existing ones. Uh, some decades ago, Actually, we and others uh, have shown for the first time in 2001 uh, the ability of tumor cells to induce lymphangiogenesis. And when tumors are able to do so, this dramatically increases their ability to metastasize. So at the time, three different groups uh, from 
different parts of um, our planet from US, Switzerland and Australia have all come up uh, with the same finding at the same time that when tumors induce lymph angiogenesis this very dramatically increases tumor metastasis and this was really um, the birth of the molecular the new era of studies um, of cancer and lymphatics which were until then really regarded to mainly um, as the drain so uh, this is the uh, late 19 um, 1990s and beginning of um, 2000s when the new era of molecular biology of lymphatics um, have begun Vascular endothelial growth factor C uh, is the key lymph angiogenesis factor, the GFC, uh, that has been identified along with its receptor by Cariolithalis group in Finland, uh, is still the most specific um, and the most potent lymph angiogenesis factor uh, in cancer. It belongs to the VGF family of growth factors and it shares some similarities and also differences. The main difference is that VGFC binds selectively to VGF receptor 3. And VGF receptor 3 is uniquely expressed predominantly on lymphatic endothelium, and this is, it is the receptor that signals for lymph angiogenesis. VGFC can also bind to VGF receptor 2, which is the main receptor signaling for angiogenesis. And this is determined um, by the proteolytic processing of this um, protein. So VGFC has the capacity to induce both lymph angiogenesis and angiogenesis, and this will depend on the um, cells that are producing it and the tissue context. Now, in cancers that overexpress VGFC, as shown here on the right, what one can typically observe are these large, uh, really big dilated lymphatic vessels inside the tumor, which are also filled with tumor cells. So every blue dot here is a nucleus of a tumor cell. Uh, in the same tumor, there may be areas where there's very few lymphatic vessels, like show here. And if the tumor generally has low levels of VGFC, the tumor will be um, mainly uh, uh, free of any lymphatic vessels. And this kind of uh, appearance of tumor lymphatics is uh, indicative of a very aggressive and metastatic tumor. In addition to inducing lymph angiogenesis, VGFC also induces lymphatic vessel remodeling and dilation. And the lymphatic vessels surrounding the tumor are very much different and altered from their normal uh, counterparts. So an early event um, is dilation of lymphatics and increased lymphatic pump, pump, uh, pulsation, lymphatic pulp pumping. This will, however, change at the later stages of tumor development when, to, when uh, vessels become uh, filled with a tumor, the lymphatic pulsation can slow down. So the whole process of vessel dilation and, um, and pumping is related to tumor is a dynamic process which initially is increased but then um, over time can change as the tumor progresses to metastasis. There is not too much known to date about the actual mechanisms, molecular mechanisms of how tumor cells enter into the lymphatics, but there are several studies that have provided um, some insight. One mechanism is by the chemokines, uh, which are made by lymphatic endothelial cells. So, Lymphatic endothelium in the vicinity um, of the tumor produces considerably, so on a regular basis, certain chemokines, which are molecules that are chemoattractive. They attract other tumor cells for migration. And typically, they express chemokines CCL19 and uh, 21, and also CXCL12, another chemokine from a related family. So this chemokine, um, Create a chemo, the chemokine gradient is created, and uh, these can attract then tumor cells which express corresponding receptors, in this case, chemokine receptor 7 or CXCR4. They can attract tumor cells um, into the lymphatics, uh, to enter into the lymphatics. And several studies have shown that if one inhibits these specific receptors, there will be less lymph node metastasis. So another rather unique mechanism is that of 
autologous chemotaxis, where the actual chemokine gradient, which uh, mobilizes the tumor cells, is generated by the interstitial uh, fluid flow, which means that the tumor cell itself that expresses the chemokine um, actually has a chemokine gradient generated around it because of the fluid flow that the cells um, encounters, rather than being attracted by the chemical gradient that is produced by the lymphatic endothelium in the vicinity. Another mechanism of um, entry of tumor cells into the lymphatics that has been identified is that of collective migration. So where tumor cells are in a mass, so still maintaining uh, these uh, homotypic junctions, can migrate to the large gaps in the lymphatic endothelium, which they induce by tumor-derived um, metabolites, in particular one of the component of arachidonic acid uh, system. So on one hand, tumor cells seem to um, be capable of entering by more traditional ways, being driven by chemokine in between this intracellular junction. Um, and uh, in, in another case, they're capable of actually inducing retraction of the lymphatic endothelial layer and entering through those gaps by collective migration. Once tumor cells enter into the lymphatic capillaries, which can be in or around the tumors, they're carried by first by the small vessels and then by the large vessels, which pump and uh, in which the flow velocities are much greater into the um, draining lymph nodes. So this afferent lymphatic tree ends in the subcapsular sinus of the lymph nodes, and that is the first site of tumor metastasis. Here is a view of the lymph node subcapsular sinus at a very high magnification. This is an image obtained by the um, scanning electron microscopy. And what one can see here is the lymphatic endothelial sinus. So this space here is really formed by lymphatic endothelial cells. And tumor cells which enter, they will first um, migrate into the sinus and adhere to the so-called ceiling um, of the sinus. And then further, they will continue to migrate, grow and grow within the sinus and later um, throughout the lymph node. Now, the long-standing con concept uh, in the field of lymphatic metastasis has been that once tumor cells enter into the lymphatics, they're carried with the flow of the lymph into the lymph node, so passively, and uh, that once they're in the lymph node, they have to um, to somehow enter uh, without any particular mechanisms and start uh, growing there. However, we have shown um, not so long ago that this paradigm may not be entirely correct and that uh, there's specific role for lymphatic endothelium in the lymph node as a gatekeeper that allows or, or prohibits the entry of tumor cells into the sinus. So in short, um, our studies have devised, led to a model of, of a tumor cell entry into the lymph node, which, contain, which, which consists of several um, individual steps. So first step before the tumor has actually arrived to the lymph node is a dilation of the lymphatic sinus. So the sinus is open. They are typically actually closed. But in response to a tumor upstream, the sinus is open, presumably to allow arrival of cells. Next step is the arrival of tumor cells by flow um, to this base of the sinus, to the junction of the afferent lymphatics and the lymph node. And from here, active migration of single cells into the sinus and across the lymphatic endothelium into the cortex um, of the lymph node, that being the last step. So these studies have identified one specific molecular gatekeeper that keeps the that that induces migration of tumor cells in the sinus and into the lymph node, which is a chemokine CCL1 produced by the lymphatic um, endothelium of the sinus. Its corresponding receptor, chemokine receptor CCL8, is made in particular by melanoma cells which then, um, upon activation of the signal, we respond to it and migrate into the lymph node. 
If this interaction is blocked, the result of that is that all the tumor cells that are arriving via afferent lymphatic vessels remain stuck at this um, base and cannot enter into the lymph node. Preceding tumor cell metastasis into the lymph node is also expansion of lymphatic vasculature. Lymphatic vasculature in the lymph node is particularly expanded in so-called medullary zone. So lymphatics in the lymph node really consist of the two main areas. One is the subcapsular sinus and the other is medullary lymphatics from which efferent lymphatic vessels drain the lymph with the cells away from the lymph nodes into the next set um, of the nodes. What is exactly the importance of this um, lymphangiogenesis in the lymph nodes uh, for metastasis uh, remains to be studied better. There are studies suggesting that this lymphangiogenesis is important and contributes to metastasis, uh, yet more studies are needed uh, to further understand the significance of that process. So once tumor cells are in the lymph node, how can they exit? They have several, they have two basic alternate possibilities. One is that these tumor cells that have now arrived from afferent lymphatics and have migrated and grown into the cortex area, they can enter into the uh, efferent side of the lymphatics, into the medullary sinuses, and then exit lymph nodes to the efferent lymphatic vessel to um, travel onto the next set of lymph nodes. Alternatively, tumor cells can also enter into the blood vessels that are scattered in this area and reach directly on the systemic vasculature. The relative contribution of these two pathways uh, for metastasis is not known at present. Once tumor cells leave the lymph node by um, either mechanisms, eventually they will reach the systemic vasculature because the entire contact of lymph is ultimately delivered into the blood as the largest lymphatic vessel, thoracic duct, connects with the left subclavian vein and deposits the entire contents of lymph, including tumor cells, into the venous blood. So this is important to remember that cancer cells arrive to distant organs via venous blood and, for example, from the upper um, part of the body, typically into the lung, as lung is the, that is the first um, major organ on that path. So when tumor cells arrive into the lung um, by, by a venous blood, they will be carried uh, by a pulmonary artery into the smaller and smaller vessels that accompany a large and then smaller um, airways and ultimately will reach the pulmonary alveoli, the zone in which most metastases are formed. Now, in the lung, lymphatics are found in a very select places. Uh, one area is uh, along, the, uh, along the veins and along the respiratory, uh, the bronchia, large and small bronchi. As these uh, large and small airways branch, lymphatic vasculature follows. In the human, uh, typically, there is no lymphatics in the alveolar region, but lymphatics are rich in pleura and also in so-called interstitial septa. And so for many late-stage cancers, it is uh, in pleural lymphatics where the metastases are often found and then eventually in the pleural uh, fluid, in the cavities, and many cell lines that are pyelometastatic have been derived from patient samples um, that have been obtained from pleural effusions. So in the lung, metastasis typically will grow um, in this type of, uh, with this type of appearance. This is an image uh, taken from an experimental model of breast cancer metastasis uh, showing tumor cells labeled in green here by green fluorescent protein in the lung. And this is what one typically thinks of uh, when one thinks about lung metastasis. However, tumor cells also have the ability, some tumor cells have the ability to grow within the lymphatic vasculature in the lung. So showing the right again in the experimental model is an example of a pulmonary lymphatic vessel that is dilated, it's enlarged, and that is completely filled uh, with uh, tumor cells here labeled in red. So lymphatic vessels are an important pathway for tumor dissemination. 
but they can only they can also serve as an important niche in which tumors can grow and this can happen at the distant sites like in this case in the pulmonary vasculature once tumor cells have disseminated away from their primary site but it can also happen in regional lymphatics so relatively close to the tumors before the no, uh, uh, the initial um, lymph nodes and that pattern for, of spread for example is a uh, in particularly well known for melanoma, it's referred to as, as in transit metastasis, where, where melanoma cells can form these lesions in the regional lymphatics and they can also form metastasis in the skin lymphatics um, themselves by coming back into the skin and growing within the lymphatic vascular tree. This type of uh, metastatic behavior has been seen in humans uh, as well. And it is referred to as lymphagetic carcinomatosis. Lymphagetic carcinomatosis really refers to the growth of tumor cells, metastasis tumor cells within the lymphatic vessels. So what is seen on the right here um, is the lung from a patient who has died of breast cancer metastasis. And every white line shown here are metastasis tumor cells, which are uh, located in the pulmonary lymphatic vessels. So in case of this patient, basically the entire organ has been colonized by tumor cells um, growing within the lymphatic vasculature. On the left is a similar sample at a higher magnification in a cross section. So what you can he see here is a, a section through the pulmonary vein and next to it is here adjacent lymphatic vessels which is completely filled uh, with tumor cells. So that is, uh, there's another one as well, um, so shown as high magnification of a lung like this. So this lymphagetic carcinomatosis um, is not uh, the most common way the metastasis present. Uh, perhaps it's more common that is typically uh, thought of by the clinicians because it is very difficult uh, to image with current imaging methods because of this diffuse pattern of spread in pathology books. Pathologists describe it actually as a fairly common between 30 and 40 percent of all metastases presenting with this phenotype. But the important thing to mention here is that whenever there is such um, a phenotype, the tumor cells are found in the pulmonary lymphatic vessels, that means an extremely poor prognosis. So these patients um, have very little symptoms to begin with. They experience dry cough because lymphatic, uh, because the tumor in the lymphatic starts pressing onto the um, airways. And by the time they are diagnosed, they typically don't have um, more than a few months to live. So this underscores again um, this striking relationship between lymphatics and the and the cancer aggressiveness and uh, further underscore the point that whenever our lymphatics are involved in any form with cancer that means extremely poor uh, outcome. Um, another novel finding um, in a, in a, within the last decade I guess already is that tumors can induce lymph angiogenesis also not only at the primary site but at the distant site. What is shown here is an example of um, lymph angiogenesis, so new lymphatic vessels being induced by a metastatic tumor in the lung. And what you can see here on the right are many, many lymphatic vessels uh, shown in red in the lung in an experimental model, and in green at breast cancer cells, which are growing within this newly induced lymphatic vasculature um, in the lung. In comparison, in the normal lung, if one looks at the lymphatics, one will see something like this. So there's very few lymphatics altogether, and you can see they're not um, enlarged. This picture on the left illustrates an early stage of pulmonary metastasis, where tumor cells here arrive first and um, adhere within the blood vessel lumen. This is a small arterial. Uh, right next to the lymphatic vessel and then by yet unknown mechanisms uh, the communication starts lymphatic vessels begin to expand tumor cells um, find their way there continue to grow and expand um, their new niche for growth 
So, um, in summary, there is a number of different alterations that lymphatic system undergoes that are associated with cancer metastasis. Uh, at the site of the primary tumor, tumors can induce new lymphatic vessels, so tumor lymphangiogenesis. The pre-existing lymphatic vessels undergo remodeling, dilation, and change in lymphatic pumping. Um, this can lead them to this leads them to lymph flow alterations, which can influence the delivery of tumor cells into the adjacent uh, lymph nodes. Lymphatic endothelium also has the ability to attract tumor cells um, into the vessels. And then in the lymph nodes, there is a first site of metastasis, a sentinel lymph node. There is significant remodeling of the lymphatic vasculature as well. First is where the lymph node sinus is open to allow for the entry of tumor cells, and the other is lymph node uh, lymphangiogenesis, which by yet unknown mechanism supports also uh, metastasis. Changes in lymphatics occur also at the secondary site, as explained, where tumors can induce pulmonary lymphangiogenesis to further support uh, metastatic colonization, but also delivery uh, to the lymph nodes draining the lung, for example. So lymph node metastasis is not only metastasis from the primary tumor into the first set of lymph nodes, it is also metastasis uh, from the secondary side into the second set of lymph nodes, which of course further indicates a poor outcome. Now, uh, uh, an important uh, new field uh, in our understanding of lymphatics in cancer has been a field of um, in cancer immunity. What has been found by a number of investigators most recently is that lymphatics play a very important immunomodulatory role in cancer. So without going into much detail, lymphatic endothelium has been found to influence uh, immunity in uh, many different ways. So primarily, lymphatic endothelium has a so-called tolerogenic function or immunosuppressive function. So by a number of different mechanisms, when lymphatic endothelium communicates with dendritic cells, how it processes um, antigen, and by the molecules it expresses, uh, lymphatic endothelium plays an important immunosuppressive role, which is thought to be important for maintaining uh, normal homeostasis and, and prevent aberrant uh, immune response in a conditions where this would be um, undesired. However, in, in the tumors, one could um, think about many ways that lymphatics and lymphatic endothelium cells could modulate and influence this um, immunosuppressive tumor environment in a way uh, that it promotes tumor development. So today there's a lot of work being done in understanding further how lymphatics contribute to tumor immunity and how lymphatics impact um, cancer therapies that are based on immunomodulation. So to um, bring to closure, um, perhaps just to summarize um, a couple of topics that I wanted to um, take home with you. One is that lymphatics, as everybody knows, an important prognostic indicator in cancer. Uh, there are important pathways for dissemination, which is also very well known and studied. Less known, uh, but a, a very well important as well, is that lymphatics are a niche also for metastatic growth. Uh, new findings, relatively new findings, have shown over years that lymphangiogenesis is important for increasing metastasis. But that being said, lymphangiogenesis is not a requirement for metastasis. So tumors can spread without inducing the new vessels, but when they're capable of doing so, this greatly increases um, their metastatic potential. And last but not least, lymphatic vessels play an important role in immunomodulation, and it is yet um, to be determined how um, this operates in tumors and how it can be perhaps exploited for better new immunotherapies. I thank you very much for um, listening and giving me this opportunity um, to tell about this topic and I look forward to answering any questions. So the first question um, I see here is how, if there are cancers 
if there are cancers for which where lymphatic spread is uh, more important? Um, and the answer to that question is yes. Uh, there are some cancers that have um, more for lymphatic preference, uh, primarily, for example, head and neck cancers. They uh, are in a type of tissue that has a lot of lymphatics, and uh, they show very much a uh, lot of involvement with, um, of lymph nodes uh, with cancer. Another example is, for example, inflammatory breast cancer, as I mentioned, that has this special affinity to lymphatics. Uh, but exceptions to this is, for example, fibrosarcoma, which is typically more hematogenous cancer rather than lymphatics. But other than that, most cancers have affinity for lymphatics, including even ovarian cancer, which is a cancer that spreads by direct seeding, but it also enters into the lymphatics, goes into the lymph nodes. So even in the ovarian cancers, uh, lymphatic uh, involvement is an important prognostic indicator. Uh, we have another question here. Uh, how do you think lymphatics can be targeted for treatment of cancer? So, um, what with the initial discovery of lymphangiogenesis, uh, um, people have investigated um, in preclinical models a lot and then moved on to clinical trials how potential inhibitors of uh, lymphangiogenesis. So, lymphangiogenesis is a potential target in that it would prevent um, cancer metastasis and perhaps also aid in uh, reducing oral metastasis. Uh, if lymphangiogenesis downstream from the primary tumor is important uh, for further systemic spread. However, what seems to really um, show potential today is somehow influencing lymphangiogenesis and lymphatics in a way they perform their immune function. So perhaps um, by targeting lymphatics in ways that we are yet to be uh, elucidated, we could find a better way um, that we can improve anti-tumor immune response because lymphatics are clearly uh, not only important pathway for metastasis, but they're important pathway for immune cells. So modulating lymphatics in the tumor will modulate the traffic of the immune cells that are important for initiating anti-tumor response, and the lymphatic endothelial functions themselves um, are important in modulating anti-tumor response. So this is where I see the most potential uh, currently for targeting lymphatics in cancer. Uh, there's another question um, here that says, how is lymphatic cancer diagnosed? So uh, just maybe to clarify here, I'm not sure, N uh, Nadine, what do you refer to as a lymphatic cancer? Because so what I've been talking about here is um, a cancers of the epithelial tissues which metastasize via the lymphatic system. Uh, then there are other classes of cancer which would be lymphatic cancers would be really cancer that originates from the lymphatic vasculature, like lymphangiomas, for example. And uh, I guess I'm not sure if you're referring that perhaps to lymphomas, like cancers that originate um, in the lymph node. So if we are talking about the epithelial cancers, how they would be diagnosed would be um, by, the, the, by looking in the sentinel uh, lymph nodes and then uh, doing a histological sectioning, labeling with the markers and finding the tumor cells in the lymph nodes. So that would be in regard to the diagnosis of tumor cells um, in the sentinel uh, lymph node. I'm not sure if I answered your question well, as I'm not really sure to what type of tumor uh, you may be referring to. Um, yes, okay, I see. Uh, so you're referring to the cancer of the lymph nodes. So in the lymph nodes, there are different, there's many different cell types. Um, so there are T cells, there are B cells, and they can um, all, all um, develop into cancer. These are called lymphomas, T and B cell lymphomas. There's a number of different um, lymphomas that can originate in the lymph node, and some of them, yes, can be aggressive, some of them uh, less aggressive. So perhaps to just kind of clarify it here, the semantics is that when lymphatics really refers 
um, to the lymphatic vasculature. And then the lymphatic system refers broadly to lymphatic vasculature and the lymph nodes and the cells that are all present uh, in the lymph nodes. So there isn't really a cancer of a lymphatic system per se, that is a very broad term, but there is a cancer of the cells that are in the lymph node, like T and B cells, so lymphomas, or cancer of the lymphatic vessels, which are cancers of lymphatic um, endothelial cells, which are pretty rare. Um, let's see if we have any more questions. Uh, no, I thank you very much for listening. Uh, this has been a very exciting experience for me, and thank you for your questions, um, and uh, goodbye.